This episode is brought by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. For my dino documentary reviews, we've covered many of the big names all the way up to the present. The Walking With Trilogy, Dinosaur Revolution, Prehistoric Planet, and so on. Even with so many reviews, there are still tons of documentaries left for me to go back to. The 2000s were just spitting them out left and right. That brings me to National Geographic's fascinating 2001 release, Super Croc. Here we followed a total paleontological legend, Paul Serino, as he uncovers the life of the giant croc relative, Sarcosuchus. The narration was even voiced by the awesome Sam Neill himself, who is basically a demigod in the paleo community. Just hearing the name National Geographic, you should already be thinking, okay, this one's gonna be based. When many other studios were chasing ratings by pumping out absolute trash, they brought us very grounded, realistic documentaries based in the science of paleontology. We just saw what they achieved with prehistoric predators, but my highest ranked program is their movie on Titanoboa, Monster Snake. Super Croc and Monster Snake share a similar formula. Paleontologists find mind-blowing fossils out in the field, they search for modern analogs to draw inferences from, and all the while someone far away works on a life-sized model that captures our knowledge of the beast. Does this mean the Sarko Croc Doc is just as great? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's dig this up. So, I gotta be honest on this one, Super Croc spends more time on living crocodilians than the behemoth itself. Sereno and reptile expert Brady Barr spend much of the film getting measurements out in the field in order to extrapolate their results and hopefully learn more about Sarcosuchus. This means it doubles as both a paleo and modern nature documentary like one you'd find on Animal Planet. I can't find much in the way of statistics on this one, but it appears to be a lower budget production compared to some of its contemporaries. Scenes of Sarko living back in the Cretaceous are severely limited. We get a scene of one snagging a fish, another one killing an Oranosaurus, and a clip of a mother caring for her young. All of these are rendered with the graphics equivalent to a PS1 game. But just take a look at this! Oh my god! It's awful! This isn't 2023 low quality, this is 2001 low quality. Clearly some more work was needed in the CGI department, but unless the budget impacts its accuracy, the overall rating won't be affected here. I will have to use different footage though of either different programs or just the extant crocodilian shown. Anyways, a lot is done very well. National Geographic always hits it out of the park. It is fun to see a full documentary led by Paul Serino. He showed up in other titles, but here he's given the full reins. Not only has he been maxing his charisma stats, the guy emanates coolness, but he's also been a leading figure in African discoveries by finding new species or new remains of known enigmatic species. Sarcosuchus itself was initially described in 1966 based on a skull found in Niger. Niger, Niger, let's not mess around in pronouncing this name. Quickly moving on, Super Croc highlights Serena's work in discovering six new specimens, one of which includes a mostly complete spine rather than just a skull. We have so much more material to study thanks to him. He's also given credit for finding and naming the middle Jurassic sauropod Jobria, a potential predator in the megalosaurid Afrovenator, Delta Dromius from the famous ChemChem Chem group, which is a whole mess I'm not getting into, and a large Spinosaurid neighbor of the Super Croc, Suchomimus. Have I ever told you how much I love Suchomimus? I wish it actually got screen time here, but Sarcosuchus itself barely gets any screen time. Sharp jaw, yeah. tight abs, oh. no flaws, uh -huh. There's so much mystery surrounding Africa and its paleofauna. So many questions left unanswered. So anyone willing to go out there and figure out what the heck was going on definitely gets my respect. Yeah, my respect. I hope they remember you. Thankfully, due to years of discoveries, we have a good idea of what North Africa was like during the early Cretaceous. 
In the glimpses we see, Super Croc delivers. It was a much different world than the deserts of today. Instead, there was a wetland biome full of freshwater rivers for a subject to stalk. Africa was hot, humid, and wet. The perfect place to find giant croc relatives. We see Sarcosuchus sharing its environment with the species from the lungfish genus Neoceratodus and Iguanodont Oranosaurus. A prevalent misunderstanding is showing Sarco and Oranosaurus in the Cenomanian stage of the Late Cretaceous, along the likes of Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus. Yeah, they never met, being separated by about 13 million years. I should clarify that 110 million years is the time given, probably for simplicity, when it's estimated that Sarcosuchus died off 112 million years ago. It would seem like too much of a nitpick to bring up later. I usually have a grace period of 2 to 3 million years because of an incomplete fossil record and people making general estimates. Showing the giant 95 million years ago? Nah, planet dinosaur, you're crazy. The overall anatomy of Sarcosuchus should get some credit too, as National Geographic captured how bizarre this creature was. This wasn't some sized up Nile crocodile, instead it had a more slender, elongated snout that ended in a really weird bulla, that bump on the nose. It looks like a gharial on steroids. In the Indian gharials though, they're only found on males and act as a sexual display and help resonate their sounds. In Sarcosuchus, their big noses had been found in all skulls, so it probably wasn't sexually dimorphic. This feature could have served as some display structure, though the exact function is still unknown. Another oddity is how their upper jaw is noticeably longer than the lower. Their large premaxillary teeth come down to cover their lower jaw in a massive overbite. Sereno also notes here how their snout shape changed as they grew. Juveniles had thinner snouts, more in line with the aforementioned gharials, so their diet was limited to smaller fish. These snouts grew wider over time, allowing adults to tackle larger prey such as oranosaurus and sauropods in its environment. Thankfully, it specified that adult herbivores were likely not on the menu. Younger individuals made much easier prey, opposed to gulping down an entire Nigerosaurus. Like I said before, a lot of time is spent with the crocodilians that inhabit our world today. Super Croc showcases the gharial, freshwater crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles, Cuban crocodiles, and of course the American alligator. There's so much to learn here about some of my favorite extant animals, as our epic paleontologist tries to uncover more about how the sarco would have lived. For example, it's pointed out how these predators have very strong immune systems to combat fungus and bacteria found in swamps. Even their open wounds caused by combat tend to heal well under these less than sterile conditions. The super croc lived in a similar type of habitat. Maybe it had similar protections against infections. Really, this is a film that would make even Steve Irwin proud. He was alive back then, so I wonder what he thought about Sarko. Maybe you've noticed how I haven't given any specific size estimates yet. I keep calling the flesh crocodile a giant. How big was it though? Well, without any near complete specimens to measure, experts have to make estimates based on the pieces we do have by comparing them to living crocodilians. In this film, Sereno and Barr wrangle different living species to measure their skull length and overall body length. By calculating the relationship between the two, a prediction is made for how long Sarko grew. The documentary and a 2001 description of the material by Sereno et al. provide a length between 11 and 12 meters. That's nearly twice the length of modern large crocs. A mass of 10 metric tons is given here, though the 2001 paper places it at 8 tons, a negative for sure, though it's faster to address here. Certainly a huge predator still, right? Unfortunately for the documentary, a more recent 2019 study by Haley O'Brien et al. doesn't use snout length that can provide varied results because of different types of snouts. Instead, she used head width, measuring the distance from the left and right jaw joints. Accurate across a range of living crocodilians, this method actually provides a much smaller estimate for Sarcosuchus, only giving a length of 9 to 9.5 meters at best, and a mass of 
only three and a half metric tons. Still a very big reptile, but not as enormous as previously believed. Our super croc may not look so super compared to the crazy Miocene Cayman, Perusaurus, and Cretaceous Alligatoroid Dinosuchus. I can't f***ing COMPETE! I just can't f***ing COMPETE! If you can look past the dated CGI, there's not much in the way of negatives. Yeah, we saw an exaggerated size, but nothing too atrocious. If they had the budget, we could have seen some wild fight between Spino and Sarko, but nothing like that ever happens, because again, National Geographic sticks closely to the science. One nitpick that kinda gets under my skin, and it is a nitpick, is how our subject is constantly referred to as a crocodile or croc. It wasn't. Yeah, I understand how these are non-scientific layman's terms, but they do have implications. If you call something a croc, your average Joe will think it's a crocodile or crocodilian more broadly. Ramphosuchus, Dinosuchus, Perusaurus, and Euthecodon are crocodilians. That last one was an actual crocodile. I'm defining crocodile as any species within the family Crocodilidae. Sarcosuchus was not. It was a Neosuchian crocodiliform, so we're in the same ballpark as the modern Snappy Boys, though it belonged to the family Folidosauridae. You guys all think you're so much better than me! Is this really that important to criticize in the grand scheme of the nations and the universe? No. Audiences shouldn't be misinformed though. Also, while Super Croc does a good job informing us about the African Sarcosuchus Imperator, we hear no mention of the Brazilian species as Hartai. Yeah, there was another species living in South America. It makes sense. Africa and South America formed the continent Gondwana and were just breaking up during the early Cretaceous. You'll notice many similar taxa between the two for much of the Cretaceous period. At least a shout out to S. Hartai would have been nice. Now, there are two questions I have coming out of this one. Firstly, the bite force. How strong was it? A force of 18,000 pounds is given, putting Sarko on par with Tyrannosaurus Rex. This is based on Serino's overestimated size though. Now that we know it's a smaller animal, how would that bite measure now? Secondly, a brief evolutionary history of the crocodilomorph lineage is given. They're said to have arisen in the Triassic around 230 million years ago, which close enough, whatever. But then it stated that more modern looking crocodiles emerged 150 million years ago. I don't know what he means by that. Is he talking about crocodiles, crocodilians, eosuchians, neosuchians, crocodiliforms, crocodilomorphs? None of these groups began in the late Jurassic, so I'm here scratching my head. If you have an answer, please let me know in the comments below, because I don't know what he means. Well, that's all I have to say on this one, folks. This short, focused movie sees a short, focused review. So much easier than a whole series that spawns several periods. Although there were a few shortcomings, they were small and forgivable. Our scientific understanding has moved on in the past 22 years, but that wasn't Serino's or Nat Geo's fault. For its time, Super Croc was a great look into the life of an awe-inspiring croc-like killer. It's a great time. If you can look past the lack of Sarko scenes and ugly scenes at that, I'm sure you'll enjoy the fun leads, mostly based information on true crocs, and Sam Neill's narration. Yeah, I can justify ranking this documentary a commendable A-. You come for Sarcosuchus, but stay for the Crocodilians. I'm glad I went back to watch this one. Of course, there are other shows and movies out there if you want to recommend any. I have a list of possible reviews to make in the future. Let me know what you want to see. And remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and to check out my social media. See you next time.